Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, sisters and brothers. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to the session this morning uh, on democracy uh, and the Muslim world. Uh, now, I have to confess, uh, I'm a little bit starstruck here to, to, to be sitting uh, anywhere near this panel, and it's my uh, honor to uh, chair proceedings. My name is Osama Said, uh, and the way it's going to work uh, for this session is that uh, each of the speakers uh, have been constrained by quite a bit. I think they could all speak for, for maybe an hour on, on this topic. Um, but uh, they've been constrained to uh, five to seven minutes uh, in order to give us enough time for question and answers uh, afterwards. Uh, so, you know, get, get, get your uh, Q&A ready uh, and we'll come for that. Now, the first speaker is um, Dr. Azam Tamimi, uh, who's the director of the Institute for Islamic Political Thought. Uh, he's a commentator on Palestinian and Middle Eastern affairs, as well as on the affairs of Islamic movements in the Middle East and North Africa. And he's authored and edited several books and papers. And um, many of you will know him uh, for having lectured on this topic uh, for many years. And in fact, he's one of the first people uh, in the UK to be talking about uh, Islamic political thought and, and how it uh, dovetails with democracy. Uh, so I'll ask him to speak first. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Um, I uh, assume that the theme of this session is the status or state of democracy in the Muslim world. So we are not talking here about theory uh, or ideology because that would uh, take a very long time to explain and to debate. And uh, because time uh, is uh, very short indeed, uh, I regret to announce to you the death of democracy in the Muslim world. I think uh, democracy has no future in the Muslim world. Democracy will never be allowed to take hold in the Muslim world so long as the world order remains controlled by the likes of George Bush and his allies. We've seen since uh, December 1992 in Algeria, a little earlier before in Tunisia, then soon afterwards in Jordan, then in Egypt, and finally in Palestine when Hamas was elected by the majority of the Palestinian people in the West Bank and Gaza, we have a clear testimony of the attitude of the powers to be regionally as well as internationally when it comes to the freedom of choice in the Muslim world. Democracy has been the fruit of the struggle of the nations of America, France, and other European countries to free themselves from the shackles of oppression and despotism. But this fruit, I regret to say, is forbidden to the Muslims in their own countries. And the reason for this is that since the inception of the colonial era, puppet regimes were installed in various countries in the Muslim world. These puppet regimes guard and safeguard the best interests as seen by the rulers of the world order. And these puppet regimes, which happen to be corrupt, happen to be undemocratic, happen to be the worst abusers of human rights on the surface of the earth, are the best friends of George Bush, Gordon Brown, and before him, Tony Blair, and the rest of the leaders of the capitalist world. And therefore, there is no willpower, there is no des desire, I would even say, there is every desire to prevent the replacement or the change of these puppet regimes. So what is the alternative? There's no time to talk about the alternative. Probably we can talk about it at some other, some other occasion. But I'd like to warn the world order and its leaders that if democracy is denied to the people, if freedom of choice is denied to the people, the only alternative is revolution. Revolution, the signs of which we can see on the streets of Egypt, we can see on the streets of Gaza, we can see on the streets of Islamabad and Karachi, 
We can see in ev everywhere in the world where true de democracy and genuine democracy is denied, and that revolution is going to be bloody, it's going to be costly, and it is something that we don't like to see, and we prefer not to uh, have it as an alternative. So democracy has been denied to us, democracy is dead, and we need a miracle in order to revive it. Thank you very much. Next is uh, John Esposito, who's a professor of international affairs and Islamic studies at Georgetown University. He's editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia on the modern Islamic world, uh, the Oxford History of Islam, the Oxford Dictionary of Islam, and Oxford, the Islamic world, past and present, uh, as well as many other books. And uh, many of you uh, will have seen his latest work that's out, Who Speaks for Muslims, uh, which actually has taken polling data, proper polling data, on exactly what Muslims uh, across the world believe. Uh, so John Esposito. I would begin with a, a kind of um, theme that I would put out there. When we're talking about democratization uh, in, in the Muslim world, uh, democratization in the Muslim world uh, exists between the authoritarianism and limited democracy of Muslim rulers on the one hand and the U.S. and in general European double standard when it comes to the promotion of democracy. And so much of what I'm going to say uh, is going to reinforce that that's the problem that we face. Authoritarian um, regimes, both uh, religious and secular, um, in uh, the Muslim world, and not any great sense that that's going to change all that much. There is some opening up, but not significant. And on the other hand, a basic policy of the U.S. and uh, much of, of Europe uh, at the end of the day, or certainly Western Europe, um, that uh, operates with a double standard with regard to the promotion of democracy. Uh, that is, uh, instead of it really being self-determination, it tends to be that the democracy that we're comfortable with is one that, uh, that uh, proceeds according to the pattern that we like, and if it doesn't, uh, then we don't acknowledge it. Uh, and there are, again, enough examples, as Am Tamimi has referred to it. We look at U.S. policy in Iraq and the attempt both in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, on the one hand saying that there's a desire to promote democracy, but on the other hand, to interfere, if not shut down, any talk of Sharia in the Constitution. We look at the U.S. and much of Europe's response to Hamas, uh, not only uh, on the one hand, having the elections move forward, elections that were free and fair elections, whether one wanted to see Hamas elected or not, but not uh, then after accepting, and even if not accepting, actually being very active in penalizing uh, and not just penalizing Hamas, but at the end of the day, in effect, penalizing the citizens of Gaza. Uh, we look at the situation uh, with regard to Egypt's blatant retreat. Uh, we look at the current problem of the Ak Party uh, and its sort of secular fundamentalist prosecutors. We look at the situation in Malaysia today and the prospect that a likely uh, a future prime minister uh, may not get in because of uh, the domestic politics uh, in Malaysia, a country that likes to pride itself on saying that uh, uh, it is an example of a democracy. We know that at the heart of part of the problem that you have with the promotion of democracy uh, in the Muslim world is on the one hand the authoritarian regimes, the Muhammad states, um, but um, uh, also uh, what you have is the support for those authoritarian uh, regimes uh, by Western governments. And, and equally important, the fear of any form of uh, Islamic party coming to power. There have been a number of panels on the whole question of Islamism, and we talked about yesterday on the panel I was on that there are those who refuse to distinguish between mainstream and, uh, and uh, extre uh, violent extremist uh, groups, but rather see them as all the same. To the extent that they are very vociferous, for example, in the West, that leads to a, uh, a fear of anything other than authoritarian regimes that Western governments support, a concern that that will mean less influence, less stability, uh, and less security. And that position is espoused uh, or, or reinforced uh, by many of the authoritarian regimes themselves, the Mubaraks, the Ben Ali's, and others, who say, uh, you know, 9-11 occurred, well, now you know what we face in our own countries, but who use that excuse 
to suppress not just, uh, again, extremist groups, but mainstream Islamists like the Ikhwan in Egypt, uh, etc. Uh, it seems to me that that's one of the, the issues. I think that in the, uh, in the Bush administration, you had a senior government official who put it very well in terms of uh, certainly American policy and who talked about democratic exceptionalism, that democracy was espoused and promoted in many parts of the world after the fall of the Soviet Union, but not in the Muslim world. Uh, the Bush administration in its second term said it recognized that and would promote democracy, but that then became uh, but the excuse for invading Iraq. And when one actually looks at, other than some statements, and they have occurred on the part of the administration, that have been critical of Egypt and Saudi Arabia, but when the crunch comes, they don't step up and actually take the strong stand. Or when one looks at uh, the Hezbollah is uh, Israeli war, and you look at the response of many uh, Western countries. It seems to me, in, in terms of the way forward, since we only have uh, a few minutes, uh, one has to then say that there is a, uh, a significant challenge here. In our Gallup poll, which looks at 35 countries and represents the voices of a billion Muslims, we see very clearly that majorities of Muslims want broader political participation, accountability, an end of corruption, uh, rule of law. They will say that they admire those characteristics in terms of the West, but they will also say, majorities, that they believe, still believe that there is a double standard. And therefore, while they see the way forward as being enhanced by a, let's say, a democracy or better relations with the West, they don't believe that really there's a desire for that on the part of Western countries uh, uh, for real self-determination uh, as opposed to determining, defining democracy as an acceptable form of um, democracy. It seems to me that the question of double standards is a challenge for Islamist movements as well. And that is what the actual track record uh, of Islamists will be, not just what they say, but what they do. And so that will remain the challenge for Islamist movements, particularly what am I talking about here? That both the West and, it seems to me, Islamist movements, and indeed governments themselves uh, in the region, are challenged by whether or not each will, de will demonstrate that it really believes in self-determination, full political participation within the parameters of pluralism, okay? What I'm saying here is, you know, all are challenged as to whether or not they can accept the fact that if they are in power, whoever they are, they accept the notion of a loyal opposition. As opposed to if I'm in power and you oppose me, I crush you, whether you're violent or not. And I think we have examples of some Islamic groups that have demonstrated, or Islamically influenced, that have demonstrated that they can uh, transcend that danger. And we can talk about that in the discussion group. But certainly, uh, the, the AK party, which is no longer formally an Islamist party, but is, is led by former Islamists, and Turkey demonstrates that. I think the challenge to Hamas is and will continue to be to what extent uh, can Hamas, in the very difficult situation that it's in, demonstrate consistently um, that it, it can be uh, um, inclusive when under siege often when it comes to uh, other sectors uh, with, with, within the society. I, I think I should uh, end now. Ah, just one final point. And with regard to regimes, some of you, uh, I don't recognize your faces here, and I know all your faces because if I run into you and you haven't been at my talk, I won't talk to you. So I memorize who's in the audience. It seems to me that the challenge for, that we have to be aware of today for some Muslim governments, and that people need to be aware of, is that what some Muslim governments have actually taken the process of democracy and outwardly seem to be using it when in fact they're creating a more authoritarian state. And I referred to that yesterday. The notion, for example, of the promotion of civil society and therefore countries like Egypt and Jordan increase their NGOs and their civil society, but in fact they are government controlled NGOs. Or in the name of broader political participation, one winds up saying, but the government needs to assure credible alternatives, so the government will continue to determine what political parties can exist or not exist. Or the government will determine whether or not there are problems with NGOs in their elections and whether or not those uh, need to be changed. So I think that that's one of the things one has to learn about. The irony that, that sophisticated people, some of whom get excellent educations outside the country, then use the, the, the facade of the language and processes of democratization 
to in fact create a more authoritarian state. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Esposito. Um, we just heard there about uh, the role of uh, a loyal opposition am amongst many things, and uh, also uh, within the democratic framework in the West, uh, the media uh, hold uh, governments to account, or they like to think they do. Uh, so I think it, it would be a good time also to hear now from Wada Khanfer, uh, the managing director of Al Jazeera, about the media's role within the Middle East. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Actually, I'm less pessimistic, more optimistic about the future of democracy in the Arab world. And yes, I do agree that right now, at this moment in time, democracy itself at the Arab, in the Arab world is facing real challenge. We don't have uh, democracies in most of our countries. However, we have democratization. And comparatively, 10 years ago, the Arab world, or 15 years ago, let us say, the people on the ground suffered from a lot of problems as far as giving them voice, as far as transparency, being able to understand or to know what is happening. The only mode of communication, of communicating politics to the, to the Arab world was, was through government-owned and government-sponsored uh, uh, media. And therefore, people did not trust these sources. So rumors and conspiracy theories were the only ways of interpreting events. Sometimes governments will do good things, but because people do not trust uh, the way that they are communicating with the people, with, uh, because people do not trust the ways of communication, actually they will receive it uh, uh, and think about it maybe as something of a conspiracy that the government is trying to market and so on and so forth. So number one, definitely people right now know they have voices, they can express their voices, and they have knowledge. From my experience, and I'm meeting with a lot of politicians in the Arab world and with a lot of people on the ground, I feel that the public sometimes is more informed than the leadership. Sometimes the people and the sense on the ground of politics and the strategic matters is more mature than what people in palaces and ministers of foreign affairs and you know the political elite have in mind. And actually, I'm not saying so because I would like to exaggerate. Because really, this is truth. You know, people right now know they can understand. Our audience, for example, in Al Jazeera, is very politicized. And from the response that we receive about issues related to politics and the news and so on and so forth. I could sense to what extent the people right now in the Arab world are aware of what's happening. And they are understanding the course of events and even they are much more capable of predicting the future than some of the political elite. Uh, second, I think through media, we have been able to put a lot of opposition leaders in front of their audience. Before, 10, 15 years ago, we would have only hear about figures who are opposing regimes. They will never, their pictures maybe, their photos will never appear anywhere. No magazine, no newspaper, no TV station definitely will carry their voice or will introduce them to the public. So therefore, some of these figures develop their own way of understanding reality. Their ideology was transferred into slogans that was, were repeated in front of the public, but without proper you know, discussion and engagement. These people were not able to develop political discourse. Right now, these people, they feel that they have to develop that mature political discourse because they will be held accountable by the public and their views will be broadcast so they will be more cautious in what they say and they have to say things that people will understand and they might even help them to task uh, about it. So that also led to more maturity on the opposition side, in my opinion, in the Arab world. Third, yes, at this moment in time, we are going through one of the most critical points in our you know, modern history in the region. And I can tell you frankly that no one amongst us, including politicians, 
and the public and the American administration and many others in the region and international politics know exactly what the next few months will have for us in the region. We, no one knows. There is a huge black hole happening right now at this moment in time. Critical point, chaos point. Either we have the you know, breakthrough actually or breakdown. Why I'm saying so? Because we are passing through this critical moment not only because of the American elections, because also of the huge transformation that is happening right now in the Arab world, in the streets of the Arab world. More awareness, more understanding of politics. People also are facing a lot of pressures economically and the commercial and, and the economic you know, crisis that is right now taking place in the world is pushing for more and more you know, dramatic maybe uh, action from many uh, uh, people and uh, political parties and so on. So therefore, the climate at this moment in time is very tense. But at the same time, I do feel and I have a sense that the future will be much better for us than what we have seen during the last decade. There is awareness from within. And there is responsibility. You know, there is a feeling of responsibility, even from opposition. I feel sometimes that the public and the opposition in the Arab world, they feel more responsibility towards their governments and countries and the future than governments. Actually, right now, I feel that governments are taking decisions and dramatic you know, and chaotic, actually, policies that might lead to a lot of disasters. And people are trying to restrain themselves because they could appreciate the fact that they need stability. You know? So therefore, there is maturity. And there is deep knowledge in the minds of the public that governments at this moment in time are very weak because, of course, they are not democratic. They have no legitimacy, but also because they could not address the issues related to the collective mind in the Arab world. We are not now dealing with the same regimes of the 60s and 70s who were able at that moment of time at least to speak about Palestine and to rally the people behind them and to, bro, to, you know, to, to propagate pro-Arab nationalism. Right now, most of the Arab regimes do not have any discourse. They cannot convince the public. They do not have any narrative that they can rally the people around. And therefore, the feeling amongst the people that we are dealing with political elite that cannot, is not capable of governing. That knowledge is very important sometimes for any next step to occur as far as democracy or as far as regime change or anything. People are convinced that governments are not capable of running the countries. And they are making a lot of mistakes and there are chaotic policies taking place. So therefore, this scene in my opinion, is very important to notice and to take into consideration while we are speaking about the future in the Arab world and the democratization process. And personally, as I said, I would love to be optimistic. It doesn't cost a lot to be optimistic, but it is much more positive and useful to be optimistic. And I think definitely with the, with the amount of awareness that we have right now in the streets of Cairo, Damascus, Baghdad, Jerusalem, and Rabat, I think I trust that our people will, will really manage the future in much more better situation than before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, I'll ask uh, Tony Ben uh, to, to speak. Tony uh, Ben was uh, Labour's longest serving member of parliament uh, before retiring in 2001. And uh, I remember one of the things that he said at the time of his retirement was that uh, he was leaving Parliament in order to spend more time on politics. Uh, and uh, we, we've seen him over the last few years really centrally involved uh, in the movement against the Iraq war. So, Tony Benn. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we are told every day that the war in the Middle East is a war for democracy. But the war in the Middle East has nothing whatever to do with democracy or with religion. It is a war for oil, and they use religion and democracy to justify that war. That's the first thing to say. And that has always been true. If you look back on history, uh, all rulers use religion to justify their wars. And of course, if you talk about democracy, I have to look at this country, 
when my great-grandfather was born in 1821, only four out of every hundred people had the vote. They were all rich men. No women had the vote when my mother was born. We have a king or queen we didn't elect. We have a house of lords we don't elect. We had an empire we controlled without any democracy at all. I spent a year in Zimbabwe when it was Rhodesia, and when Britain controlled Rhodesia, all the good land had been given to white farmers. No African had a vote. No African was allowed a skilled job. And now we lecture them on democracy. So I think this just has to be seen like that. Also, I remember all the people we locked up. We locked up Mr. Gandhi. I met him in 1931. We locked up Nehru. We locked up Mandela. We locked up uh, Kwame Nkrumah. We locked up Chedi Jagan. We locked up Jomo Kenyatta. And all the people we locked up ended up having tea with the Queen as head of Commonwealth countries. And when I go to America, I point out that when we had an empire, we were very unpopular. And when we gave it up, people quite liked us. So don't pretend that Britain stands for democracy. But on the question of religion and democracy, this interests me and I'd like to talk about it. My mother was a Christian and we read the Bible every night and she said something to me I've never forgotten. She said the Bible is the story of the conflict between the kings who had power and the prophets who preached righteousness. And she taught me to support the prophets against the kings. And it's got me into a lot of trouble in my life but the older I am, the more I realize that some people use religion to get power for themselves. Other people look at what the prophets taught, and the prophets all said the same thing. We're human beings. We have rights. And then the prophets encourage people to challenge the kings. I mean, if somebody tells you to do something, you say, who gave him the right to do that to me? And out of prophetic teaching came the demand for democracy. And I have worked out five little democratic questions. If you meet a powerful person, ask him five questions. What power have you got? Where did you get it from? In whose interest do you exercise it? To whom are you accountable? And how can we get rid of you? And if you can't get rid of the people who govern you, you don't live in a democracy. And uh, that is uh, what it's all about. Now, uh, you see, what democracy does is to transfer power from the rich, from the wallet, to the ballot, from the kings to the people, sometimes maybe from the popes to the people, because the Catholics don't have a democracy. You can't elect the pope. In the Church of England, it's nationalized. The prime minister appoints the Archbishop of Canterbury because Henry VIII nationalized the church. So democracy is a challenge to religious structures, but not to the teachings of the prophets. And one last point I make, I think that, uh, I think that uh, every generation has to fight the battle for human rights again and again and again and again. You no final victory and no final defeat. And what keeps it alive are two flames burning in the human heart. The flame of anger against injustice and the flame of hope that you can build a better world. And my job at 83 is to go around fanning those flames as hard as I possibly can because I think the future of the world and peace and every country in the world depends on anger and hope changing the world so we all have justice and peace. Thank you for listening. And uh, long, may you keep, long may you keep at it. Um, Lastly, in, in terms of the uh, presentations before we move on to, to Q&A, uh, is Robert Lakin, uh, who's the Director of the Immigration and National Security Program at the Nixon Center. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he's currently writing a book entitled Europe's Angry Muslims, uh, which, is, which will be published by Oxford University Press. Uh, he's also written an article previously on the Muslim Brotherhood, which was uh, published in the Foreign Affairs Journal, uh, and which got him into a bit of trouble as well. Uh, so, Robert Lakin. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to. Oh, is this is this on, not on? Yeah, on? I'm afraid I'm going to get into a bit more trouble today, uh, because I have to say that I think the relationship between the United States and democracy, and I say this as one who is firmly opposed to the war in Iraq, is much more complex than some of our my 
predecessors on this panel have suggested. Um, I don't think uh, democracy, I think for some in the government, democracy was, quote, an excuse for invading Iraq. But I think for many, um, it really was a motive. And I think it's because they shared the view of uh, my colleague from Al Jazeera that um, uh, there uh, was some uh, basis for democracy. Um, they shared the view uh, of uh, 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 Assam Tamimi that uh, there were puppet regimes, that the United States had supported puppet regimes. And furthermore, after 9-11, they took the view that terrorism, that the attacks from 9-11 came from authoritarian regimes uh, that had suppressed democracy. I'm not saying these views were correct, but I think they were the views, and I'm, you know, living and working in Washington, that's uh, the conclusion I come to from talking to many of them. Um, so their, their view was that uh, we're going to, uh, uh, when it came to Iraq, they would replace the Iraq, the regime in Iraq. They felt that they had the right, somehow, to replace the regime in Iraq with a democratic regime. And, in, and some of the, the apologists for the war actually spoke of a, that Iraq was going to lead to a tsunami of uh, democracy, not only in, in through the Middle East, but all the way into Asia, et cetera. So they supported regime change, quote unquote, in Iraq. Um, I think this was a deeply misguided view that you could coercively establish a democracy. Uh, I think democracies we know from history uh, tend to be, tend to have uh, preconditions or need to, that, that before democracy is established or can be established, usually you need to have a functioning market economy that brings people into the market as economic citizens. Uh, you need to have a, a, a history of civil rights and freedom. And uh, the population has to be loyal to the country uh, above its loyalty to a tribe. Um, so I think this was a profound mistake. Um, but uh, I have to say that the, some of the, the apologists for, for the, the war were, quote unquote, consistent Democrats. They wanted, well, let me say that they, some of them were consistent Democrats. Others uh, were interested in democracy primarily where there were strategic, uh, um, uh, in, in par where there is what they call the strategic imperative for it. Um, I want to I want to uh, share the the uh, or or endorse or whatever support the comments of my colleague uh, John Esposito when he talked about the importance of consistent democracy not just for Americans but for Islamists as well. I think that's a tremendously important point. Uh, I think we I think one of the reasons why there is a reluctance, uh, probably the main reason why there is a reluctance in quarters in the United States to um, uh, bless or to uh, allow, if, that's, if, they, if they have the, the opportunity to allow or disallow, an Islamist regime from, uh, from uh, uh, taking power is that they, they fear, uh, as John put it yesterday, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And it, that, that, that uh, Islamists would s say they supported democracy when they were out of power, when they come into power, as in some countries where we've seen it already, um, they failed to practice it. They were inconsistent Democrats. So I think that's an important lesson um, from history. Um, how much time do I have? I, I think I'm pretty much finished. Is that yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll open up to the floor. Uh, if we could take that uh, gentleman there in the, in the purple shirt first. Yes, many speakers have rightly drawn parallels between the lack of democracy in Muslim countries and here. Or perhaps this could be extended it's not just a matter of inconsistency about the democratic character of the governments in Muslim countries. It's also a particular model of democracy. And many of the speakers referred to elements of 
the neoconservative strategy, though without calling it that, as was expounded by the Project for a New American Century. And this had a specific model of democracy, which they attempted to impose on us here and I mean, throughout the world, anywhere. But they had a greater opportunity in Iraq, they thought, to recreate the country in the model of their ideal democracy, which they could not so easily impose here, namely the facade of democratic elections, a regime that basically contracted out all public services, which of course would no longer be public services, in the case of Iraq, contracting out and even selling the, off the, uh, the access to the oil resources, and support for Western imperialism. Of course, these objectives are inconsistent and contradictory. So that's why the, uh, so I want to ask the question, how do you see these contradictions being played out? And what John Esposito rightly raised the, the issue around civil society being created or shaped in the image of authoritarian regimes. That also sounds similar to new labor, if we think about the policies over the last decade. So perhaps we should be more specific about their version of democracy versus ours. How do you see those contradictions being played out? Maybe we could take a, a couple of questions and then come back to the panel. The, uh, the, the gentleman in the purple shirt. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, a comment and question. Um, on a positive note, satellite television um, headed by Al Jazeera um, uh, and the proliferation of the internet um, platforms in the examples of YouTube, for instance, uh, Facebook and others, um, have been hailed as a, um, agents of, of change, of hope, of support to civil society organizations in the Arab world. I do support what Wada Khan and other colleagues have, have said. But um, regimes certainly know how to play the game, especially in the case of Arab countries, for, for instance. When we take the example of um, uh, the um, meeting a few months ago of the Arab um, uh, information ministers and the pack they put together to further censor, uh, censor satellite television, and know there is talk about how to control and censor the internet. Um, also, the, um, 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 the support to entertainment for entertainment media and probably uh, Al Jazeera faces such challenge, in my opinion, with regard to uh, the existence of hundreds of satellite television channels which are overtaking the concerns of young people in the Arab world and also in the West for entertainment programs, reality television programs and so forth. So the uh, question very briefly, um, how has the, um, uh, this phenomenon of the further control by Arab regimes through different ways have hampered the work of satellite TV channel journalists like Al Jazeera and others. Um, and can the media, um, um, uh, in um, uh, comment of what um, uh, Azam Tamimi have said, can the media actually lead Arab street and mobilize Arab street and actually initiate revolution? Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. You know, I think state, of course, is still in the Arab world is very important and very powerful and very strong but it is much more less strong and does not have the, uh, it is not attractive anymore to the people. Even what you have referred to about the issue of the ministers of, foreign, of, of information who met and who wanted to bring us back 10, 15, uh, send us back 15 years ago, they could not establish, I mean, they could not convince anyone and eventually the whole document collapsed. Right now, I cannot, I mean, the document during the last few days, they had a meeting in Cairo again, and they discovered that they cannot impose such restrictions on satellite channels because basically time, the trend of time has, has gone beyond them. Second, the issue of model, I would like really to say the following. If you would like to define democracy in a systematic way, I don't know everyone can, we are not now philosophically discussing what does democracy mean and what are the steps to achieve democracy and so forth and, 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 and so on. In my opinion, Right now, there is environment that leads to awareness and proper understanding and pushing for more freedom. But definitely, this kind of model is not exactly the model that the new conservatives would like to implement in the Arab world. No doubt about it. This model emerges from within the collective mind of the Arab world, from within the shared memory of the Arab world, from within the culture. 
But we have to develop this model. This model is taking the values of democracy, not necessarily some kind of mechanical understanding or systematic understanding of democracy. That is a matter of argument. We can speak about it for a long time. We don't want to, the word democracy right now at the Arab world is, in the Arab world is accepted even by Islamists. Political Islam right now does not have a problem during the last 20 years maybe. Before that, they had a problem. But right now, everyone is advocating democracy. It means advocating the right of people to exist, to express their opinion, to sh share power with them, and to acknowledge their presence and to not to, to, to exclude them from, from the future of their countries. So this is a major development that we should also look at. Now, the model, whatever you would like to call it, that is up to everyone. But eventually, there is environment that is growing, will push further for more and more freedom. John, uh, if I could ask you, John, on, on, on the first question, in what way will uh, or, or could democracy in, in the Middle East differ in the way that it's arrived at, but also in its, in its application? Well, I, I, I think that I think that I prefer to answer it this way, and it may not be answering you quite directly because otherwise I'll be repeating what was said before. Um, in the Gallup World Poll, we wind up talking about two groups in the Muslim world, when you look at the majority of the Muslim world. We're not dealing with violent extremists. We're talking about the people who were polled. We talk about mainstream, and we talk about potential radicals. And it all has to do with their attitude towards 9-11 and some other questions. But basically, mainstream of people who see 9-11 as unjustified. Th they may be uh, anti-American, but see 9-11 unjustified. Politically radicalized are people who believe that 9-11 was justified. And yet, they are people in mainstream society. They are often actually more optimistic about their own personal futures, but not about the future of the region and not about the future internationally. Uh, they tend to be actually more than the mainstream. They tend to be uh, better educated, more internationally aware, um, you know, more successful. And one of the things that we point out is that if one is talking about the future of, let's say, democratization uh, and relations with the West, the hopeful thing is to realize that the politically radicalized are really people who can be worked with. And they're the people that ought to be the target audience, as it were, because if if their cynicism about whether or not the West will, quote, allow real democracy continues, then they become, some of them, future extremists. Th the problem is, it seems to me, that there's a tension today. For example, if you take the UK and the US, and I'll be very brief, their public diplomacy policies, okay, have in fact, in general, failed. And part of the problem with regard to public diplomacy, certainly in the U.S. situation, is that there's a failure to realize that public diplomacy isn't just about public relations. It's not just about educational exchange. It's not just about, it's not, it's not even something that says, well, the real problem is you don't understand me. The problem is a lot of the people we have problems with are people who understand us quite well and judge us as hypocritical. They admire our principles but don't see what we're doing. The failure has been that we don't deal with the foreign policy side. And what you often see when you do polls of Westerners is that Westerners will tend to say, as do people in the Muslim world, we need to move forward, we need to know each other better, we need to have exchange and educational reform, but Westerners tend to stop on taking really seriously the significance of foreign policy. You, know? you can see that in the debate within, with, uh, during the Blair administration about whether or not the Iraq war really had any significance in terms of radicalization. And there's a kind of denial of wanting to go in that direction. Lady at the front here. Sorry. Lady at the front here. And then, uh, okay, the, the, the lady uh, in, in the black uh, after that. Assalamu alaikum. My question is to the panel that how can we tackle terrorism in non-democratic Islamic world? How can we bring those warring young, uh, youngsters into the main flow? Terrorists, we call them terrorists. They are fighting for their rights. How can you bring yes. those in the extremes yeah. into, into, the, into the mainstream? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and if we could uh, quickly... She was asking how um, you can bring um, 
in the meantime, if you could take it over to, to the lady in the black over there. The uh, lady was asking um, uh, how you can bring people that are currently on the extremes uh, and possibly engaged in violence into the, into the mainstream uh, in regards to this debate. Um, it was the lady in the black. Uh, you could put your hand up again, just so identify yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah that's it. Thanks. My question I want to ask is, um, well, to all of you really, but especially to Azam Tamimi, that there is a lot of, um, it is very common for the lack of democracy to be blamed on America and outside forces. Um, and I think this is actually, um, this is a problem in itself that um, it is being blamed on outside forces and we need to look as Muslims to internal reasons as to why democracy has been uh, uh, so difficult to take root in the uh, Muslim world and there are um, uh, uh, there's a culture of authoritarianism even existing in certain interpretations of uh, Islam which have uh, um, been going on down the centuries and this is not something new and not something um, specifically related to um, uh, Western influence or Western um, plots. Um, if you look at the Umayyad and Abbasid empires, they were also extremely authoritarian and, and um, uh, it is um, in no coincidence that most of what was being called revolutions in the Middle East has in fact um, been just coups. And there is no guarantee that if uh, um, some of these parties like the Muslim Brotherhood, and which um, are now calling for democracy, that if they get into power, they will in themselves become uh, dictators. We have to change the internal mindset and the theological um, discourse around uh, uh, how to share power. And yeah, I think so. Um, Dr. Azam, do, do you want to take that? Um, of course, to every problem, there are uh, local uh, reasons, there are external reasons. I keep hearing this uh, claim that the impediment to democracy is internal. And I challenge anybody to prove it. Look at the case of Hamas. The election in Palestine in January 2006 was hailed by international observers, by world powers, even those who refused to accept the result afterwards, as having been among the best elections ever held in the region. And then what happens afterwards? The Palestinian people are collectively punished. Hamas continues to be ostracized. And until today, we have difficulty bringing in medicines and essential commodities into the Gaza Strip, simply because the Palestinians made a choice and because Hamas was honest and was sincere to its democratic pledge. Let's look at the Algerian experience. When FES, when the uh, Islamic uh, Salvation Front uh, won in the election, France, the rest of Europe, and then the United States of America, all of them supported the army generals who crushed the ballot boxes with their tanks, tanks imported from Europe. Our problem are the bastards who are ruling the world in the world order. This is our problem. They keep saying Israel is a democracy because the Israelis elect a government that continues to persecute the Palestinian people. You tell me, what has this got to do with democracy? So to blame it on us, to continue to whip our skins in order to divert attention from the real cause of the problem, that's most unfair to ourselves. I haven't seen a single example of an Islamic movement that won power through democracy and then reverted to autocracy. Not a single case. 
people sometimes point to Sudan and Iran. The government of Sudan did not come through democracy. It came through a coup d'etat. The government of Iran did not come through democracy. It came through a revolution against a puppet of the United States of America and Israel. When the Islamic movements are given a chance to come to power by democracy, and then they replace democracy by autocracy or despotism, then you come and hang me. You come and hang me. But I tell you, if there is true, genuine transition to democracy, democracy will persist and democracy will live. But not the sort of democracy that the West wants for us. A democracy of the sort of the government in Kabul, or the government in Islamabad, or the government in Cairo, or the government in Amman, or all these puppets that are serving the satans of the world, of the, of the world order. The democracy we want is where we have the freedom to choose our governments. I conclude by saying this to you. I recently was in Morocco, and I interviewed Sheikh Abdel Salam Yassin, a great man, a man that when you sit with him, you have this scent of the Sahaba themselves. I asked him, I said to him, it is rumored that you do not recognize the legitimacy of this regime, that is the Moroccan regime. Without hesitation, without reluctance, he said, indeed, indeed we do not. How can we recognize a regime that does not believe in Shura, the pillar of Islamic governance. Shura was killed once by these puppets in our countries and then continues to be killed and buried by those who support them in Washington, in London, in Paris and the rest of the Western world. I don't blame the Muslims for the lack of democracy. 9-11 would not have happened had there been genuine democracy in the Muslim world. 7 July would not have happened had there been genuine democracy in the Muslim world. I'm not condoning 9-11 or 7 July, but I say these were direct reactions to the injustice that has been incurred on us in various parts of the world. Leave us alone, give us our freedom, and let us rule ourselves for a change. Okay, we'll take uh, the front first. <coughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you, Osama. Um, for me, I, we're discussing democracy in, in, in the Muslim world. The Muslim world is mainly you know, the third world or what's called the developing world now in uh, political correct terms. Um, but true democracy is about, as far as I'm aware, making an in informed choice about how you want to be governed without any coercion. Now, in a lot of these countries, what we have is a phenomenal amount of illiteracy and in many places, people living under a dollar a day. Can you really have a democracy where people are illiterate and therefore cannot make informed choices because they don't have access to the information required to make an informed choice? And can you have a democracy where people are not free uh, from coercion because there are landowners or people in power who control their, you know, whether they live or die simply because they are so poor? Gentlemen, uh, just on, on, on the row here. Um, I was um, in Damascus um, a few months ago during the last um, Arab summit, uh, the Qumma Arabiya, and I remember that um, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, the ruler of Libya, uh, told um, his fellow Arabs, um, leaders that um, um, the uh, United States had actually invaded an Arab country, a member of the Arab League. They got hold of um, uh, President um, uh, Saddam Hussein, a member of the Arab League, and they had hanged him. And then uh, he turned around and said, be careful, you too, because if you do not tell the line, you too will be hanged. So, although Gaddafi is not exactly um, in uh, odor of sanctity, but now the West has whitewashed him because he's towed the line, all this talk of democracy, in a way, uh, forgive me if I'm a bit skeptical, is almost futile because if an Arab state will not 
toe the line, will not do the will of the empire, they will go the way of Iraq and the way of Saddam Hussein. Okay, can I come to uh, Robert Lakin first uh, with, 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 with the first question about um, <coughs> education and whether people are ready to uh, take on democracy within the Muslim world? Well, I, I think it's a, is this working? Um, you know, from the, if, if, if we understand democracy not as a slogan, not as a um, uh, uh, word we bandy about for, for uh, rhetorical purposes, but as a system of government, uh, you know, I think it is uh, incumbent to look at the conditions uh, where democracy has been able to uh, develop. And generally, they, they have and certainly involved literacy. So I would agree with the question. Okay, uh, Tony Ben, uh, the, on the second point there, that none of this really matters because if this, uh, if a democratic regime popped up in the Middle East, that if they took a, a position against America, then simply they'd just be bombed away. And there are the examples of, of what's happened in, in Gaza and over the last couple of years as well. How do we get over this problem? Well, I think <coughs> we have to recognize that, just to go back to religion for a moment, globalization is about the worship of money. The West worships money. And that is something we don't admit. The Dow Jones industrial average is more important than the Ten Commandments. I've never met Dow Jones, but he works very hard every hour on his averages. And I think we have to understand it in that sense. Now, as to the question of violence, you see, I have to be honest with you. When I was 16 years old, I was trained as a terrorist. I was taught to use a bayonet, taught to use a rifle, taught to use a revolver, taught to throw a bomb, taught to fire a missile, and if the Germans had arrived in Britain and I had seen a German in a ref restaurant, I would have thrown a bomb into the... Was I a terrorist or a freedom fighter? You have to think this out. The right to defend yourself. I'm against violence, but the right to defend yourself, and I don't see any moral difference between a stealth bomber and a suicide bomber both kill innocent people for political reasons. And that's something we've got to get across. But uh, the point about the abuse of power is quite right. All people in power tend to abuse it. That's why I said every generation has to fight the same battles again. And uh, uh, so you have to be careful about people who come in in a revolution and say, I'll give you democracy. And when they get there, they, f they prefer to be dictators. So you have to go on, but don't ever despair because hope is the fuel of progress and fear is a prison into which you put yourself. Don't put yourself in the prison of pessimism. Uh, keep your machines running on the, on the fuel of hope because that's how the world has made all the progress it has made and we must never ever forget it. Okay, we, just to inform you where we are, we, we had a slight time extension, which, which was good, but we've only got uh, three more minutes. So what I'll do is I'll take three more points from the audience and then ask the, the, the panel to sum up. Uh, we'll take the, the man over there in, in, in the gray shirt first. We'll take the lady here with the purple pen uh, afterwards and the, the, the man over there in the waistcoat uh, and the red tie uh, third. Thank you. Uh, I think... Uh, personally myself and everyone over here in the conference, we would like to go back with a very positive inspiration. And what is your message towards all of us? What should we do? I think we, we all know that what West is doing with the Muslim world and we're not going to beg for the freedom. What shall we do? Shall we wait for a revolution or shall the media play a big role? What, what is the direction towards the solution? Thank you. Okay, and, and the lady here with, with the purple pen, if you could just keep your hand up just now just so, so the stewards can see you. I'd like to know if, along with the proliferation in the media in many, many Muslim countries, but especially in the Arab world, would you say that there's also been a growth in some kind of fledgling organizations that take seriously and challenge governments on things like accountability, rights of minorities, just human rights, education, that kind of thing. Because surely that's the kind of thing that will lead to a much more homegrown democracy. 
Uh, I'm thinking about where I was born in Pakistan. I recently traveled there. And if there's an accident in the streets of Karachi or Islamabad, the chances are it's not a government ambulance that's going to come and pick you up. It's going to be someone, a private individual, who set up a fleet of ambulances. Now, if the state can't even take the responsibility of looking after its citizens when there's an accident in its cities, what hope is there for democracy? Okay, and the final point from, from the gentleman there. <coughs> A lot of the points which I wanted to make or questions have been, uh, have been answered, but um, I think through history, and I think Tony Benn and a few other individuals have stressed on this, uh, Brother Tamim, um, through history, governments or powers have been finding ways of controlling people um, and have always been in this pursuit and search uh, of controlling people as, as a source as a, for commercial purposes and um, through the erosion of civil rights and civil liberties not just in our country but especially in the Muslim world um, are we now not on the brink of an absolute revo revolution in the Middle East which will only reshape the very, the very peace or justice in the Middle East because if you look across the world all the powers are just trying to work a way of getting away with as much as they can whilst they're in power in their search of absolute greed. Okay, I'll just uh, give an opportunity to, to the panel to make any concluding remarks they, they may wish to make. Uh, I'll start uh, down at the, the far end uh, with, with Tony Benn first. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you very much indeed for inviting me. I think it's been a really interesting discussion and one we could have across the United Kingdom because the defects of democracy here are very strong. The question that was just put, I touch on, I think Desmond Tutu, truth and reconciliation, is better than a war crimes tribunal. I think it's funny, when I look at the world and through which I've lived, the three moral leaders of the world, not one of them have been European, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu. These are the people who've taught us the morality we need to survive as a human race. And the more dialogue we have, the better. The more discussion we have. My, I have uh, two little granddaughters in a primary school in London with 77 nationalities and a refugee centre in the school. And if I talked to them about multiculturalism, they wouldn't know what I meant because they have Muslim friends, Jewish friends, American friends, African friends. And the world we're living in it's got to be a world where we treat each other as equals in every sense, to respect their knowledge, their understanding, their religion, their faith, their art. And if, the, I suppose, in a way, that's what this huge exhibition is about. I must stop, but thank you very much for asking me. I've had a wonderful time at this meeting. John Esposito. I agree with my colleague about, a, <coughs> excuse me, the importance of literacy. Um, but sometimes I worry that that importance of, uh, of literacy becomes an excuse both by regimes and by um, some experts and government people for uh, attempting to shut down the whole question of whether or not one needs to move along a process of democratization. There's no reason why one can't do that. And one also has to realize that there are very literate people who turn out to be quite authoritarian. Um, and then with regard to civil society, to answer your question, it's, it's, it's been a problem from the Arab world to South and Southeast Asia that you know, part of the reason why governments uh, become more authoritarian and try to shut down any form of non-government social services, educational services, is that they know that it is an implicit and indeed an explicit indictment of their ability to deliver. However, that has not prevented the growth of these uh, organizations in, in, in many Muslim countries. Uh, in 1989, there was a lot of optimism that the breeze of democracy was blowing across the world. 20 years on, I tell you that revolution is imminent. A revolution is inevitable. When you see poverty uh, force people to line up the streets of Cairo, of uh, Damascus, of Amman, uh, of uh, Rabat, to wait for a few pieces of bread for hours when the rich gets richer and the poor gets poorer. 
and uh, democracy has become a ploy in order to domesticate some Islamic movements who have given up on the struggle for justice and freedom, then the only alternative is revolution. In fact, in 1991-1992, about 32 countries in Africa, in South and North Africa, started the political or multi-partisan uh, elections. And uh, during that period, everyone rushed to implement democracy. And then the Western advisors who were actually imported quickly to shape the process itself, they advised certain kind of, of, of procedures. In three or four years only, most of these countries did not democratize. And most of these countries actually, again, came back to much worse authoritarian system of governance. Eventually, and in my opinion, democracy is a model that we should adapt from within our societies. And when you speak about informed people, yes, our people are really informed. Some of them are illiterate, but I must tell you, they are much more informed than the literate people. You know? not, I'm not trying to defend, I'm not a nationalist actually by nature, but I'm telling you so because we have developed an oral tradition of talking to each other for the last 1,000 or 2,000 years. People when they sit in the tribal circles or they sit in the Sufi movements and, or when they sit in the social system, they do exchange a lot of thoughts and ideas and they scrutinize politics and they talk about issues. My grandfather when I was a kid, you know, I used to see him sitting in, the, in, that, in, the, in front of the mosque after, after the evening prayer with the old men and discussing issues related to politics that I have really picked up at that age, you know, although they were illiterate, but definitely with media and with many other communication modes, people are informed. So definitely I will give them, I will give them a chance to develop democratic system and also to de develop democratic model from within their culture and from within their perspective as well. It's, it's dismaying to hear revolution invoked at this day and age as if we'd learned nothing from history. Those of us, uh, I, I spent some time as a revolutionary, pretty serious level, I know a lot about revolution. But it, you don't have to have been one to know that what revolution has almost inevitably produced has been totalitarianism, has been dictatorship and oppression. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the people in the, in the Middle East and in Muslim countries who have been patient will continue to be patient and not grasp at a false solution. I think it's a real um, oversimplification to equate a stealth bomber with a, with a suicide bomber. Uh, suicide bombers, uh, stealth bombers when they, when they uh, uh, hit civilians are uh, punished deplored. Suicide bombers, when they hit civilians, are considered a victory uh, and are applauded. Um, so to invoke Gandhi in the name of stealth bombers or suicide bombers is pretty absurd. Um, finally, I think uh, it's all very well to talk about an oral culture, but there have been studies of oral cultures and it shows that it's like the game of telephone. When the word is spread, it's distorted by oral. We need literacy. We need to be able to read, to study. Don't contempt, condemn your own societies to the backwardness of an oral culture. The West had an oral culture. Homer was a product of an oral culture. But it wasn't until they had literacy that they were able to develop real democracy. I don't know of any oral culture which is a real democracy, but in, with all due respect... India? Well, India. I, did, I don't know enough about India to say, but I don't... Uh, but uh, it seems to me that India is trying to develop a literate culture, not an oral culture. <laughs> we are trying to also. Okay, uh, thank you to the panel. Uh, thank you also for your kind attention. Uh, I think the debate is going to continue uh, offline. Uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, there's going to be, according to the program, a, a big political debate. Uh, I don't know what we've been having for the last hour and a bit. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>